so the next speaker is Wayne Keen Wong from Oregon State, and he'll be talking about um, talking about citizen scientists and estimating their skills using species accumulation theories. Okay, thank you very much, and I just want to point out that this is um, joint work with a large number of people from Oregon State University, uh, Cornell University, especially the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and also uh, Carlo Gozzi at the University of Michigan. And um, the paper that I'll be talking about is actually down here um, with the reference down there. So um, we all know about eBird, that's already been talked about, so I'm going to skip the slide, but I'm going to address the central issue of, of this paper, which is there's a trade-off between data quantity and data quality. And whenever you're dealing with citizen science data, um, you need to account for all these different sources of variation and bias. This particular talk is about uh, dealing with the variability and observer skill at detecting birds and classifying birds by species. So the central hypothesis of our paper was um, trying to use species accumulation curves to quantify observer skill. Um, previously, these curves were used to measure species richness, and basically what um, these graphs are showing is each dot here corresponds to an eBird checklist, um, and each eBird checklist has associated with it the duration in the minutes it took to accumulate that checklist, and also the number of species on that checklist. So the far left graph there, um, which I think belongs to Chris Wood, um, is that of an expert who really knows his stuff. And the far right graph here belongs to somebody who's really a novice, um, who really doesn't know his stuff. Might be mine, um, I don't know. But it's very, very shallow, as you can see. So our, what we're exploring in this paper is trying to see, can we actually use these species accumulation curves to assess observer skill? OK, so the research questions here are, can we do that? Um, and can we also look longitudinally, does participating in citizen science projects encourage or result in volunteers becoming better observers? And finally, if we account for observer variability, can we actually improve our species distribution models? So to answer these questions, um, what we're going to do is we need to account for other factors besides um, just other factors that influence the number of species detected at a given location and time. And so you need to account for these different factors and they, they all contributed to our model. So very briefly, our model is basically a Poisson uh, generalized additive mixed model. And we're trying to look at um, predicting the number of species on a checklist K as a function of um, features that are based on duration to accumulate the checklist, uh, features based on things that affect species richness, for example, habitat, um, features describing the observation process, um, and also features describing the individual observer. Um, one particular one that's of interest, which I'll come back to in a couple of slides, is this um, checklist number, which is your cumulative um, checklist index. And there's a coefficient lambda there that I'll talk about in just a little bit. So using this, this model, um, which I very briefly described, um, we're gonna use it to answer our research questions. Um, in order to do this, we need to build what's called a species accumulation curve index, and this quantifies an individual observer's proficiency, and it's basically the number, the expected number of um, species an individual observer would, would see. And you need to standardize this by setting some of these covariates to their expected values. I'm not going to have time to go through this because there's quite a bit of detail here, but I'll refer you to the paper. This species accumulation um, curve index is then a very nice sort of one number summary of what the skill level is supposed to be, and we're going to explore the effects of this index. So the first question is, can we use this um, species accumulation curve index to quantify variability in observer skill? So what we did is we took all our eBird participants and ranked them by this index, and we looked at the detection rates for various species um, between the highest quartile group, those that had a lot of species reported on your checklist, versus the lowest quartile groups. And we looked at which species had the biggest differences between these two groups. And what you would expect to see is actually what we found, which is that um, for species that are very easily detected by people, for instance, by novices and experts alike, um, you would have something that is like what's there on the left-hand side. And for species that are very difficult for um, people to detect, for instance, those that involve um, really specialized knowledge about what to look for or very difficult to detect by sight but a little bit easier by sound, um, this is actually what you do in fact see on the right hand side. And I know I'm going through this fairly quickly but I'll refer you to the paper um, if you're interested in these details. The second experiment was actually one that um, I want to get to and spend a little bit more time on which is does participating in a citizen science project result in volunteers becoming better observers? And so we had a, a fairly large amount of data here to work with. I think it was something like eight years worth of eBird data. And we can track how each um, participant is doing over that time. 
So um, using this checklist, um, cumulative checklist index, we can look at this lambda coefficient, which you can think of it as like an average learning rate for a participant. If this lambda coefficient is something that's positive, that's generally good, it means that they're actually getting better over time. Now remember, the next slide I'm going to show you is actually um, based on averages. So here's an example of the average um, for a particular, um, sorry, the average for a participant in BCR23. You can see that the very bottom line is the first checklist, the next line up is at checklist 10, the next line up is at checklist 100, and then so on up to checklist 1000. And a similar sort of trend appears on BCR31. So the general thing that we're seeing here is that observers accumulate species at higher rates with increased birding. This generally is showing that they're improving both their detection and identification of species. But this rate of improvement does slow down a little bit over time because they're getting better and better. But of course, you know, you'll get up to a certain point and you're pretty good there. So again, um, these are just averages, but they're a very encouraging and interesting result. Um, the third experiment that we want to explore is does accounting for observer variability improve species distribution models? And the basic idea behind this experiment is you take the species accumulation curve index and you throw it into your model as a feature or a covariate. And then you look and see if whether that feature improves your model or not. So we did this with a couple of experiments. Um, these graphs basically plot uh, with and without the, uh, that index. And you can see that everything is above the diagonal line, both in terms of AUC and in terms of kappa, suggesting that um, adding this, this uh, SAC index really does, in fact, help uh, improve these models. So um, just to very quickly wrap up, um, these species accumulation curve indices um, have been shown to be very, very effective as, as a quantitative and objective measure of observer skill. Um, they're great for accounting for sources of bias, and we're actually one of, one of the few um, citizen science projects to have run a study where we actually looked at our participants and were able to see signs that they're actually getting better with more practice as they get involved with eBird. And I think I'm all done with time, so thank you very much. So we actually have time for one or two questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so there, there's a lot of details there because obviously you'll have people showing up in the middle of the people that start and then they drop off. And yeah. so you have to sort of chop your, your data to include only the ones that are within that time period of study. And there's a, the bulk of the participants actually are actually in that group. There's a few that come in or leave. Um, so I think the results are still pretty strong like with just that group that we looked at. And so I, I can talk to you after the, after the session and we give you a little more of the details. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Take one more question while I can catch that from the So, um, now we're kind of trying to do this with photographs, and so there's several uh, there there are several layers of bias we're coming from, not only from observer, but okay, you see the animal now, the next. That was to actually take a picture, and now to share the picture, and now to share it on social media, if they're going to be collected. So, how far can you propagate this uh, idea of bias quantification in all of these? Yeah. Um, it's a question that you don't have to answer right now. Yeah, I, I have to think about it. Um, but it is, it is an interesting question. I, I think you're, you're in a slightly different domain from me because there's, there's a few more layers here that are not present in our, our current domain. Um, I'll have to think about it and give you a little bit more of an in-depth answer afterwards. Okay. All right, let's thank our speaker again.